Good evening, everyone, or afternoon. The time is 4.33, and the September 11, 2024 Climate Change Action Plan Ad Hoc Committee will come to order. My name is Dr. Kenneth Harris, Vice Chair of the Board of Education, and it brings me great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting, and I look forward to our conversation. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Boozer Struthers, Pamela Boozer Struthers, a uh, board member for the Board of Education as well. Ms. Adelon, will you please call the roll? Dr. Kenneth Harris? Present. Ms. Buda Strother? Present. Donald Bell? Present. Kate Wonderlich? Yatsi Gomez? Jo Joseph Jacuda? Christina Locke? Uh, if that was Christina Kwok, that's me, present. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay, present. Timothy Meyer. Present. Dorothy Morrison. Present. David Noto. Present. Beth Novick. Ramon Pelicia Calvo. Benjamin Roach. Antoine Thompson. James Dubar Garcia. Present. Maya Gudera. Olivia Thomas. Sophia Villar. And Michael Witherspoon. Present. Thank you, Ms. Adelaide. And for the record, um, Mr. Jakuta just dialed in. So we have him present as well. Uh, what, how are you doing, Joseph? The question is, shall, shall the committee adopt the September 11, 2024 Climate Change Action Plan Ad Hoc Meeting Agenda? Is there any discussion? Ms. Adelaide, please call the roll. Donald Bell? Sorry, Dr. Kenneth Harrison? Here. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Buddha Strother? Aye. Donald Bell? Kate Wonderlich? Yatsi Gomez? Joseph Jakuda? Aye. Christina Kwok? Aye. Timothy Meyer? Aye. Dorothy Morrison? Aye. David Noto? Aye. Beth Novick. Ramon Pelicia Calvo. Benjamin Roche. Antoine Thomas. James Duborn Garcia. Aye. Maya Gudera. Olivia Thomas. Sophia Villar. Michael Witherspoon. Aye. Uh, can you read me back the count, Miss Adley? Nine in the affirmative. Thank you. There's nine, nine, in the, nine in the affirmative, zero in the negative, confirming that the September 11, 2024 Climate Change Action Plan Ad Hoc Committee meeting agenda is adopted. The next question on the floor is, shall the committee approve the June 26, 2024 CCAP meeting minutes as distributed? Is there any discussion? Um, yeah, just a point of order. I'm not seeing the actual document and board docs. Were they distributed otherwise? We may need to, to add these to the next meeting. Let me see. Because I, I know I saw them, but I didn't see them in board docs. I looked at my email. Um, let me just see. You said there were documents shared? The the minutes were not posted to board docs, so I don't think oh, the full committee can actually right now. review them. the last meeting. I'll post it right now. 
Okay, so we'll move. We'll move this. Circle back. Yeah, we'll move this item. Uh, so we will strike item one point five, approve of the meeting minutes for June twenty sixth, twenty twenty four, to redistribute those on board docs. All right, everyone. Moving forward to item two point oh. Uh, just a reminder, colleagues, we'll be limiting our discussion to two point five minute rounds, and there will be two rounds unless there's a motion to extend it for a third round. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Director Dorothy Morrison for the sustainability report. Director Morrison, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Let me just get on camera. I was in transit, so bear with me. <laughs> All right, let me get on camera. All right. So good evening, everyone. Um, so let's see. I think I have a brief update, just some highlights here for you. So I did share with um, Cindy, if she was, I don't know if she has the information to post on the screen. If not, that's fine as well. But um, I wanted to start off by introducing our nearest member to the Department of Sustainability and Resiliency, uh, Sheila Stevens. Uh, Sheila, did you just want to, before I go ahead, just say a few words about, you know, where you're, you're coming from and whatever else you want to say to the board. Sure. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I started in this position July 1. I came from Calvary County Public Schools, 11 and a half years of basically managing um, and leading their sustainability efforts, uh, as well as the energy manager, um, green school coordinator, uh, you name it, I did it all. But um, so I'm happy to be here and looking forward to sharing my knowledge with uh, within with working within a school system and supporting these efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. I have to add that Sheila has hit the ground running. You know, she's a great asset to us and we're very lucky to have you on board. So um, the next item here is, well, also just, I guess, while we're on the staffing uh, piece of everything, um, just wanted to also say, oh, thank you, you pulled it up. Um, we have uh, the second round of interviews that are being scheduled for the second uh, program manager position that will complement uh, Sheila's position. If you recall, we were advertising for two program managers and we have one to date. So um, that's in progress. I also, I don't recall, but I think the last meeting was in June. I think it was in June. So um, I didn't get to announce that we have, in addition to Sheila, we have transitioning to DSR, which is which stands for Department of Sustainability and Resiliency, existing staff for building services. So we have Jimmy Alston, who is energy management analyst from building services. And then we also have Sarah uh, Gillespie, and she is the recycling compost coordinator. So um, those are also moving to DSR. We're happy to have them on board as well. I uh, wanted to announce that we will be having a media event. Um, we're calling it for now, of course, the name might be subject to change, but we're calling it the Driving Green Action in Prince George's County Public Schools. And that's currently scheduled for. Wednesday, October the 2nd, and that is Energy Efficiency Day, and it'll be from 9 to 10 o'clock at the Ellen Achoa Middle School. And of course, the purpose is to showcase uh, the district's recent achievements in sustainability, including things like grants, award, renewable energy projects, and our climate-focused uh, curriculum initiatives. So more to come on that. Very exciting to be able to um, let other know, others know the good work that we're doing. In terms of the annual report, um, and is it Cindy that's presenting right now or uh, somebody else? It's Cindy. Who's presenting? It's Cindy. So Cindy, if you, you want to just hover over the highlighted section. Um, oops. Never mind. Okay, so that's not working. Well, I just wanted to say that the climate action report is um, available online. And, you know, so a lot of what I'm saying here obviously just highlights, so you can get more details about the progress that we've made uh, throughout 2024, or I should say 2023, 2024 school year. So that's in the annual report. Um, it's also available online. And, and of course, there's the 
the web link. Uh, moving right along, Cindy, do you want to just continue? Thank you. Um, I also wanted to announce that, you know, we have design underway for the alpha structure Mullican bus slot in Bowie. And I know we have, hopefully we have Sean on board who could probably speak more to that, but I wanted folks to know that um, we are working on the infrastructure piece of it. As you know, we have, I think we've secured up to about maybe 40 electric school buses. A few of those are physically here that have been inspected and they meet our criteria. Um, but unfortunately, we still have issues with the charging infrastructure. So hopefully, um, working with Alpha Structure, we will have um, the charging infrastructure in place uh, to charge up to 90 buses. And um, along the lines of grants and revenue opportunities, we have recently applied for the EPA heavy duty, I believe called the heavy duty electric vehicle, something to that effect. But um, it was a two point, I'm sorry, $3.5 million is what we requested in the grant. And the grant is going to include replacing our old diesel buses with um, with electric buses. It's also going to include infrastructure uh, to help us build out our EV infrastructure. <clears throat> it's a $1.2 million cost share that's associated with that grant, making a total of 4.6 million uh, total. Uh, we are in the process of, of reviewing EPA community change grant. So I'm not gonna go into details with all of these. You know, obviously I can uh, speak to folks that are interested you know, I guess at a different time, but I just wanted to let folks know that we are looking at all possible available grant opportunities to help supplement um, a budget to do sustainability work. Um, there's also a new MEA grant announcement um, that has come out. Uh, if you all recall, we are a recipient of the Net Zero Award grants as well as the, um, I believe it was for school lighting. That all falls under the, the MEA decarbonization grant uh, program. And then also wanted you all to know that uh, we meeting, you know, the Office of Sustainability yeah. meetings with our finance departments to start looking at ways that we can apply for the IRS tax rebates that are available for decarbonization projects. Um, we can get up to 40% back of our investments. So geothermal, you know, so that's a lot of money. We don't have that money on the table. So we're starting the process um, of doing that. Like I mentioned, we have Sheila on board. She's very knowledgeable in this space. So we're definitely gonna be looking to her to help guide us through that process. And um, Cindy, you wanna scroll down? And I guess the last thing is just to, you know, let folks know that we are doing what we're calling a sustainability integration roadmap. So we're meeting one-on-one -on -one with all the operations departments getting a better understanding of the functions, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, and how we could align those functions with um, performance that would also, uh, I guess, supplement or augment uh, the, the CCAP action items. So just want to let folks know about that. Any questions? That's it. <laughs> All right, let me get my screen back up so I can see questions if anyone has them uh i'll go first um so thank you for your presentation director morrison one question i have around grants is is there a process in place for maybe um constituents stakeholders community members that have identified or know of grants that can potentially be helpful to the school system or they feel that can be helpful to the school system is there a process we have in place to not only um talk through those grants but um I guess, include them in the process if, if that's something we'd like to pursue. Yeah, I mean, I would say so. I mean, one of the things that we're definitely trying to do a better job in trying to identify grants, um, like I mentioned during the last meeting, we are we are seeking consultant support that is JLL specifically that is going to be helping us um, sort of comb through all the different grants and actually help us apply for it. Now, I have been getting, I get emails from, you know, your other, other board members, uh, Pam Bruce Struthers, and, you know, the community at large with potential opportunities. Um, so I try to look, because I know grants are very time sensitive, so I try to make that a priority 
to kind of come through. So it'll be wonderful once we have the consultants ready to go to be able to say, hey, you know, this is this works, you know, go for it. So yeah, there's definitely um, an opportunity to do that. They can send they can send me an email directly or you know some other I guess member of my team, and we will definitely look into it and work with our consultants to sort of you know get those grants going. Okay, so I hear all my emails are now forwarded to you. I'm gonna give you all the emails. It'll go through your office. Got it. Got it. <sighs> I guess you can interpret it that way. <laughs> Sounds good for now. Um, okay. And turnaround time on consultants. I know you mentioned it and you're in the process of doing it now, but do you have a a, a soft date that you're targeting? Well, I w I'm hoping hopefully by next week because we already have, we've what we've done actually is we've amended a scope, an existing consult scope. So we just kind of ex expanded the scope of work. So that's been done. Um, a task order has been written. We just need to go through some, you know, budget issues internally and that will be ready to go. Okay. Understood. Okay. Thanks. That's my time. Uh, colleague Pamela Buzis, rather. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for the report. Um, great updates. I did want to check. I'm very happy to see the uh, rebate work uh, begin. I just wanted to kind of level set our group of understanding which projects qualify in terms of year delivered. And I, I, I just wanted to be clear if, if Ellen Ochoa and William Wirt get to be included or were they ahead of the law and that we're really looking at our next eight that we've begun the groundbreakings for. Well, you know, the exact language, um, I couldn't say exactly to my understanding is that the year in which the, the project comes offline online. So Elena Cho would certainly qualify for 2024. So now Sheila, feel free to jump in, but that's my understanding that we will definitely benefit from from, from those that came offline on 20, in 2024. That is correct. Um and William Wirt, Wirt, Ellen Ochoa, as long as it went once they go in service is what the, the language is. So we could capture them for 2024. And if the solar does get installed and we get everything worked out within this 2024 year, uh, we'll be able to add those as well, possibly depending on, there's a lot of different scenarios and stipulations, but ownership versus PPA, but um, there's a slight chance we could claim those as well. Yeah, that <clears throat> I appreciate hearing that. That's really good news on the new the new buildings this year that open i in the um, alternative construction financing if that has any implications i know we're being you know closely watched you know on the intersection of alternative construction p3 and that issue of you know working with developer teams and then for the tax credits that they come back to to pgcps or the county so those are the type of details that I'm really interested in making sure that all of us can speak to really clearly because this is a lot, a lot of money coming back. And this is the piece of the, the work that, you know, the majority of our county constituents are excited that we're taking this climate action framework for long-term maintenance and construction, but uh, there are many others who are excited about the tax savings dollars for the school system. So I want to make sure that we uh, all can articulate that we understood that that future, when we worked on this plan a couple of years ago, we understood that that future was coming and now it's really here with these tax rebates. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, colleague. Um, seeing no further hands, I'm going to move on to the next agenda item here. So moving on to 2.2, we're now going to discuss turf fields versus natural grass fields. This will be uh, priority seven on our climate change action plan. So the chair once, and once again recognizes Director Dorothy Morrison for an update on the turf fields versus national grass, natural grass fields. Did you want to just, I guess you still have the Cindy, you can, you can close out the report right now. So for the natural grass fields versus the turf fields, we have three representatives from operations who will be leading us um, in that discussion. So we have um, Director Stam Stefanelli. I'm not sure he's on. Let me just maximize my screen for a minute. Um, just got to so I'm is here. He, is Sam, oh, yeah, okay. So there's Sam Stefanelli. Um, 
Director Sean Matlock. I don't know if he's here. And then we have- um, I'm here. Okay. And then we have a supervisor uh, from CIP, William Smith. So with that, I will turn it over. I'm not sure who's leading. Would that be William, if, Sean? If, if, you could, if I could frame just for a moment, Director Moore. Sure. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so the Climate Change Action Plan is a call to action, uh, and it outlines the transformational commitments that are needed to guide our behavior and requires every PGCPS stakeholder to change the way we live, work, learn, and play. Uh, that's directly from the Climate Change Action Plan itself. Uh, it goes on to say that the approach taken by the PGCPS CCAP, or Climate Change Action Plan Focus Work Group, to developing a comprehensive and actionable plan around achieving significant environmental metrics was threefold. Leverage the expertise and experience of current initiatives for growth of, and economies of scale. Integrate best practices and lessons learned from Prince George's County, as well as other locations. And third, engage and listen to our community early and often, starting with our students and staff. And so based on that feedback and that, that, that wonderful guidance from our uh, Climate Change Action Plan Focus Work Group, the Operations Division uh, believes it's, a, it's critical uh, that we continue to take this approach uh, as we work to fully implement the plan. It is important that we leverage expertise and experience that's in our grasp, uh, that we integrate best practices and lessons learned, and that we continue to engage and listen to our community. Uh, so as such, we're grateful uh, for this opportunity this evening to engage with the Board of Education. So thank you uh, for this opportunity to come before the ad hoc committee uh, and the public uh, to discuss uh, uh, a variety of topics central to implementation of the CCAP. Uh, these engagements will be helpful by providing opportunities to dialogue uh, and generate additional ideas, uh, generate feedback, and ultimately recommendations as we work to surmount challenges that arise with implementation of this comprehensive plan. Uh, tonight's topic, discussing natural grass versus artificial turf fields, is an important area that needs discussion. Uh, when looking to implement the recommendation focused on transitioning sport, sports field surfaces to natural turf, there are implications for availability for use by the school system and the community. Uh, costs of installation, maintenance requirements, school site constraints, and questions of equity. Uh, so it's important for us to have opportunities like this uh, to better understand how to address and move forward these teams, these, these uh, 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 challenges collectively. Uh, and so we're really excited uh, about this opportunity, not just about this particular topic, but as we move throughout the year, uh, because this will give us a platform in which to engage the board and the community uh, so that we can really uh, continue to implement our climate change action plan in the spirit in which it was written. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the team uh, so that we can begin this discussion. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you all for this opportunity to present uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Smith. I'm the Project Management Supervisor uh, for the Dep Department of Capital Programs. Um, I have been one uniquely uh, kind of challenged to, uh, that has been leading this effort for the school district uh, in terms of just our, our turf field conversion projects and ultimately now our comprehensive stadium renovation projects. Uh, tonight, as discussed, we have uh, Director uh, Sean Matlock, who is joining to assist with this discussion, and also uh, Director Sam Stefanelli uh, from the maintenance side, building services, to discuss uh, from his his position as well. Um, tonight is is really just a brief, uh, just overview, uh, a few slides, just to talk about you know kind of where we are, uh, and to give an overview on the the you know stadium projects as a whole, uh, but then talk about the CCAP, and then ultimately. Uh, we hope to engage in a in a fruitful discussion to just you know talk through kind of where we are, the impact, some of the challenges that we see uh, on a day to day basis, some of the concerns that we're hearing, uh, and just to make sure that we are uh, position ourselves to move forward in the uh, the appropriate way uh, going forward. Um,
So as part of the presentation today, we'll talk about kind of where we are and we'll go through just the historical timeline, uh, some of the funding that we have received to date. Then we'll move towards the CCAP and specifically with uh, the priority number seven, uh, number four more so uh, about transitioning sports field services to natural turf. Uh, the third, we'll talk about just the challenges, uh, whether it's the funding and, and penalty impact, uh, usage uh, impact, uh, and some others as well. And then lastly, we'll close it up with discussions. So where we are, or <laughs> In terms of our timeline, so this initiative started in 2013. Uh, this was something that was heavily, um, you know, I think we were the last school district or one of the last school districts in the state of Maryland to actually start implementing uh, turf fields. Oxon Hill High School uh, at the construction of, uh, of that school was the first field that we had in a district that was uh, a turf field or, or a synthetic turf field installation. Um, subsequent to, to delivering that project in 2015, uh, you know, this was something that was heavily championed by, um, you know, state uh, uh, delegates, uh, senators, et cetera. And they pushed uh, to align, I want to say it was like $2.8 million uh, from the state uh, to push, you know, Gwen Park High School and Dr. Henry Wise High School uh, to, to also receive uh, turf field uh, conversion projects at those sites. In 2017, uh, though, that was our third phase uh, of projects in which we were able to implement Charles Flowers, Bowie High School, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Northwestern High School. Uh, in addition, that year we turned over Fairmont Heights, uh, the new Fairmont Heights, which also uh, you know, contained a, uh, a turf field project uh, or turf field as part of the stadium uh, that was constructed there. In 2019, we had Potomac High School uh, in which we were able to deliver, followed by 20, you know, 2023, which we had a little hiatus due to funding constraints uh, and, and some other challenges uh, in which we were to move forward with uh, Bladensburg High School stadium renovation project. And then finally, just wrapping up on Lowell High School stadium renovation as well. Uh, the next products that we have in the pipeline, uh, Frederick Douglass, Carlson High School uh, and uh, Duval High School as well uh, in terms of the next kind of uh, trio uh, to move forward with um, saving renovation projects. In terms of funding breakdown, uh, in terms of funding spent, uh, roughly over the years, we have spent $26 million towards this initiative. 14 of that uh, a million of that funding has come directly from the county. 12 million of that funding has come via uh, state bonds and bills. Uh, and then lastly, we have 9.2, uh, an additional 9.2 uh, in a bond bill, which we received from uh, the state uh, via the Board of Public Works and which uh, is moving forth with uh, being able to deliver uh, Frederick Douglass and Crossan. So that is actually earmarked and will be spent here shortly as well. These are just some of the projects in which we have completed in the past. Um, you know, from the one on the top left, that is Bowie High School's uh, a project that was completed in, in 2017. Uh, to the right of that, you'll see Northwestern. Uh, on the bottom right, you'll see uh, uh, Charles Flowers High School, which was completed. And then to the bottom left, you'll see Bladensburg High School. All of these projects, for the most part, uh, the earlier phases of the projects really just contain, you know, uh, artificial turf uh, transition, uh, but then also we added stadium lighting. Some of the newer products that we have currently are more comprehensive in that approach to where, uh, to where we're actually doing, you know, the, the fields, we're doing the track and field events, we're doing the stadium bleachers, press box, we're doing egress lighting, ADA upgrades, um, you know, uh, scoreboards, LED monitor scoreboards, the, the full gambit as part of the stadium renovation projects. So as we get to the Climate Change Action Plan, CCAP, uh, we have, of course, everyone's aware of party recommendation number seven to commit to climate uh, resilient land management, uh, specifically with number four, transitioning sport field services to natural turf. Uh, as part of that, it, it identifies or uh, it is, um, yeah, we understand that in essence to convert all existing turf fields to natural grass, but then also to include natural grass fields as part of future stadium renovation projects going forward. 
This next slide is really just to talk about some of the challenges that, that we see as a result of uh, the initiative. Uh, the first group is more so on a financial front, cha uh, financial challenges. Um, you know, the, the main one is, is more so just the funding aspect, right? Um, it's the funding aspect to, you know, support the transition of existing turf fields to natural grass, uh, but then also subsequent funding to continue making the improvements that we need uh, within a district and a category that has been historically underfunded uh, with facilities that are uh, not equitable uh, across the district uh, and are in really bad shape. Uh, the next one is the uh, you know challenges with the state and private funding impact. Um, as discussed, you know a lot of the funding for these projects came in by way of um, you know state bills and bonds that earmarked uh, th those funds directly for turf field projects uh, to support transitioning our fields to turf fields. Uh, and you know, and typically with the state, um, you know, you have a certain period of time in which. Uh, you have to have a project online uh, before you actually go through and replace it. And if you actually replace it before that term period, now the district is liable for reimbursement of those funds. And so trying to understand what that impact looks like. Also, uh, we received funding in the past from the NFL and also uh, the commanders uh, to, support, to support these projects as well. Uh, and so trying to understand what that impact could be in terms of um, you know, funding impact or penalties. Uh, and then also we have the current MOU agreement in which we have negotiated with uh, Maryland Capital, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning uh, for our MOU uh, and trying to understand what impact that has as well. Um, the next group we have is more so just around the usages and the usage challenges. Uh, of course, just within, you know, uh, Prince George's County, you know, we have uh, limited resources in terms of land uh, for our athletic teams. And so uh, if you compare us to some of our neighboring partners, Montgomery County, uh, Anne Arundel County, Highward County, et cetera, uh, they, their facilities for high schools, they have multiple uh, athletic fields. They'll have you know, soccer fields and lacrosse fields and football stadiums, et cetera. And so when it comes time for uh, just the scheduling uh, and usage for their fields, they're able to do so in, in a more efficient manner. Uh, but then also in a manner where it doesn't tax, uh, you know, their, uh, whether turf fields or their grass surfaces that they actually have. Um, and so that is one issue that, that or one challenge that, that we notice uh, that the CCAP um, initiative may have. Also, just uh, the, the use with Maryland National Capital Park and Planning and Boys and Girls Club, you know, all of our sites are community sites. Uh, our sites are, you know, after, you know, we are prioritized with uh, usage on our fields, uh, they then fall to parking planning and boys and girls clubs for their usage. And so if you talk to any of our athletic directors in our schools, uh, you know, all of our fields, specifically the turf fields are fully locked up, you know, months ahead of time uh, because they're in such high demand. Um, and I think going forward with Maryland National Capital Park and Planning and, and maybe Director Stefanelli and, and Dr. Coleman, can speak to that uh, at a later time. Um, at some point, we're actually transitioning the maintenance aspect uh, over to Capital, uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning in exchange for their continued use for all of our turf fields. Uh, and so that is something I know that's either you know ongoing in terms of negotiation or has wrapped up negotiation and you know needed to understand what that impact will be as it relates to that as well. And then also, I think we just had in terms of usage and its challenges is uh, the rapid deterioration of our football fields, our stadium fields, um, because we only have, you know, our, most of our campuses, their primary field uh, will be the stadium field uh, and, and having a heavily utilized, it, you know, comes at a, um, a significant uh, deterioration um, rate uh, in which it's hard to maintain and, and keep up with uh, keeping those fields in, in a um, and a good playing um, uh, quality surface uh, to make sure that we're, you know, prioritizing safety and, and health uh, while also being able to uh, efficiently, you know, schedule games throughout the district to be able to use those fields. So that is one area uh, of concern as well. Um, some of the other challenges that I have in, in, in the right-hand side is really just talking about just, you know, the community impact uh, and, and understanding that, you know, we, um, and I'm sure you guys as well, we, we receive emails probably on a, a, a weekly basis, a weekly cadence in terms of understanding where 
um, you know, each high school's you know, priority order is, uh, when are they uh, due for you know, turf field installations, um, you know, there, you know, all of our schools, you know, have been promised turf fields uh, in the past because that was the initiative. And now understanding that, you know, potentially some of those schools that may, may be a shift in that and understanding what impact that's going to be. Uh, also, I think, you know, talking about the political impact, um, I mean, we are, you know, if we're receiving you know, weekly emails from uh, the community, multiple uh, members of the community, we're, we're receiving, you know, probably twice a week political emails, uh, trying to understand uh, where some of these projects are, what's taking so long, um, and, and um, especially as it relates to some of our fields that are just in bad condition. And so trying to understand what that looks like on the back end. Um, and then I think one of the other things is really just equity, um, you know, not just equity within the district, but equity across the, the state. Uh, you know, many of our, our student athletes, their pathways uh, to college really is through uh, athletics. Uh, and we have a huge percentage of student athletes that are able to go to that second level uh, and compete at the second level uh, via scholarships, things of that nature. Uh, and then if we just look at, you know, where we are with, within the district, having, you know, uh, 12 of our stadiums, uh, turf fields, uh, and the other balance uh, still with grass fields and, and still in a waiting list in terms of replacement, there is a huge equity issue there. But then, uh, you know, if we start talking about, you know, continue with the next group of projects in terms of natural grass in lieu of uh, turf fields, that then raises the issue with equity. Um, and so that is one of the things that you know, one of the concerns that we had I'm just trying to understand what does that look like. Uh, and then I think, you know, we can talk about maintenance concerns. Um, you know, Sam, uh, Director Stefanelli will be more so directly related to that um, in terms of just concerns of, you know, turf fields uh, versus natural grass fields that from their experience, um, you know, I know from our end, uh, the maintenance aspect is substantially less. Uh, there, there really isn't a period that you have to let the fields rest for and so you're able to utilize them at a high frequency. Um, and, and, and with the main maintenance requirements is just to you know, periodically go out and sweep and groom the fields and make sure the fibers stick up appropriately. Um, you know, make sure that we have the infill that is, uh, um, you know, level set back into the areas and make sure we have safety in terms of the, the rebound and bounce off the fields. Um, but we, will, we can, you know, kind of dive back into the maintenance concern uh, at a later time during the presentation or discussion. And so with that, I wanted to just frame up some of the, the areas of concern that, that we had and wanted to see if we can just kind of talk through uh, comprehensively uh, what the approach could be or should be uh, moving forward for this category. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I don't know if any other member of your team wanted to um, speak to that point, but colleagues, we are, the floor is open for questions at this time. If you have any questions concerning the turf versus natural field discussion, Ms. Novick. At first, when I looked at the agenda, I thought, oh, wow, I might be bored at this meeting. But then as I heard a very fine presentation, thank you for that, Mr. Smith, I thought, wow, I have direct experience with this at a new school, at Kenmore Middle School. We've not been able to use our fields for last year and this year. They were, I do not, please do not use my um, like anecdotal comments as, um, gospel because I don't all I know is from the side lines I know we're not having baseball um this for this season or softball for girls because our fields which are grass fields had problems last year and had to be all regraded and actually a student was injured so one other thing I would add on to that is student injury um as something that could happen. So when they did that, they figured out that when they laid the fields out, there were problems with the grading or something that it redo the whole thing. And now they look done, but apparently they're not done. And so we're not having baseball and softball again. Um, and I don't know if we'll have soccer in the spring, which was canceled last year. And therefore we had to compete against teams who did have fields to practice on and our kids didn't have practice time. Plus they didn't have outdoor time or exercise time. That's one thing. Um, and then finally, 
interestingly enough, this is kind of a flip. Our fields are habitat for geese. When we built the new school, the geese got all dislocated. You could see them waddling across Ardmore, Ardwick, Ardmore, Ardwick Road because they didn't have the fields at Kenmore anymore where they used to be their habitat. And um, now that we have the school back, the birds are like, oh, there is some grass back, but there's goose poop all over the fields. Um, so that's an interaction. Plus, we did use near our field, fields for area of um, bioretention ponds. And so there are some fragile environmental areas nearby the fields that would be pretty seriously impacted if we had some steady hardcore games going on over there. So that's just some things to think about based on my personal experience. And I'm sure James is here. He might be able to speak to that because he might not have been able to play soccer last season. If I could interrupt, I have some information about the maintenance of the field. I was having trouble unmuting my mic uh, after Mr. Smith was if you'd like me to provide that information, I can. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Stefano. Okay, so from the maintenance side, um, we were looking at the the original um, conversation about turf fields versus grass fields was that we were going to look to put uh, additional resources into our grass field to see if it was sustainable to use grass fields as opposed to turf field. All of what Mr. Smith talked about, about the field usage, is something that we really have to consider because we in this county, um, we want to provide a, a fields for not only ourselves, but for the community and youth groups. Um, so our football fields, especially our stadiums, get quite a bit of use. Um, as a general rule, for every hour that you use it, you want to let it rest for an hour. And that's just under normal season, um, the, the normal football or soccer season, um, playing time. Um, the one thing that we did run into was this year, um, I, I'm, most of you are aware that we were performing our routine maintenance at Duval High School. The contractor, uh, unbeknownst to us, put some soil on the field that was unsafe and which caused us to have to um, stop, st strip the field, uh, reside the field, which is going to cause us to miss all, most if not all, of the football season. Because the one thing that we cannot um, adjust for is when you have a grass field, you have to have a recovery time. So if there's an issue with a turf field, we have a contractor that goes out, they can sew up the seams, they can fix the turf field, uh, redo the infield, and tomorrow we're playing on it. If it happens on a grass field, it, it, in this case, it's six months before the grass can, the field can fully recover and it is safe for the students to play on. That's one thing that we, we, we learned this year over Duval. And I think we're having the same issue in some of our new schools where the field had to be repaired. And now we're, we're looking at having to, you have to have a six, seven month recovery time in some instances before we can actually use the field. That's one of the downsides of grass field. Um, the, the maintenance cost of a grass field is typically about 35% more than um, than a turf field from our standpoint. Um, so as we move forward, uh, we can't just look at the, um, because of lessons learned this year especially, we cannot just look at the amount of time between games. We really need to take into consideration that if there is an issue with the field, if something happens, it's flooded, It uh, something gets on the field that's um, – and the geese, we have an issue with them everywhere. Um, the recovery time is months, and we usually lose at least one season or maybe two waiting for the uh, natural grass field to recover. So that's one thing that we do need to take into consideration. We're going to do our level best to provide a, a field we spent – uh, I think it was four hundred and seventy thousand dollars at Parkdale. We took the field down to took all the topsoil and all the side of the field, replaced the sprinkler system, added I believe it was one hundred and fifty tons of topsoil, resodded, and uh, we are using that as our test case for this program that we are establishing on the maintenance side that was planned before um, the CCAP 
before we got our um, marching orders from CCAP to just improve our field. So we're going to use Parkdale. And what's what has to happen now is that this is phase one. The, the side is down. It is here to. It's ready to play on. However, um, it's we use Bermuda grass as our base, and that's going to go dormant in the winter. So what's going to have to happen is after this year, next fall, next spring, we're going to have to oversee with rye, and that's the typical athletic turf. You have a rye grass, um, you have a Bermuda grass base with a rye grass overseeding which will give you a green color in the winter time when the Bermuda grass goes dormant dormant and starts to turn gray so it's a two-year process to, to to from start to finish to have a field that is uh renovated and ready to play on and at any time during that process if anything um happens that that um derails this process it could be months to fix that issue. The The biggest issue we have between um, turf field and grass fields is the recovery time for repairs. And that's something we've learned this year uh, in several locations that I don't think we were considering when we were talking about CCAP, talking about this year on a CCAP. So the the cost is, is um, it's a little bit better for turf. However, I think the recovery time for the grass is going to be our biggest issue when moving forward with grass fields. Thank you, Mr. Stefanelli. Uh, before I get back to discussion from the committee, Mr. Matlock, is this something uh, that pertains to the original presentation? Yes, and to the discussion. Uh, as uh, Director Stefanelli was pointing out, uh, you know, the part of the issue related to this is also water usage. So one of the reasons why the, some of the middle school, um, new middle school P3 fields were not ready was because of, we had some drought conditions this summer. And it made it impossible for us to pass, properly get those fields ready to go, get them watered and, and all that sort of stuff so that we could actually grow uh, the turf necessary for those fields. Um, and it's something that, um, again, uh, when we're having these hot, hot summers, um, water water usage, the amount of water available, the amount of rain available, is also one of those things that's a rate limiting step on our ability to make the field playable for the game. So, you know, that's that's a big issue and it's had an impact on almost all of our P3 uh, fields, except for the ones that are turf, which have gotten, uh, which are seeing a lot of community use, um, quite a bit of community use, in fact, to the point that uh, there, you know, we're having some issues related to that. So um, it, it is, you know, uh, we have seen uh, the turf fields be more ready to play um, uh, upon construction than we have with the uh, the grass fields. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just make a note. And who's next, uh, Mr. Jakuta, and then Miss Kwok in that order. Uh, thank you, Chair Harris. Um, I was only a half, 30 seconds. Yep. No, oh, I, thought, it's I, the I had two minutes. So we have, so I was yeah. not ready for 30 seconds. There you go. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, so I, I feel like when we were doing the CCAP, this was one of the hardest issues to grapple with. Um, so many more of the solutions we were talking about were much more straightforward. Um, it does part of me is you know looking at what the nfl is doing the nfl players association apparently in a recent poll 92 percent of them want grass fields because in the nfl you're less likely to get hurt playing on a grass field but that the thing is that's a well-maintained grass field um whereas you know it, it, we're in a different league than the nfl and and it's important to make sure the student athletes are are safe and 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 um, being able to play, um, it does kind of hurt me in the wrong way that if the NFL is moving to grass, why they're funding these? But that's a different story. Um, I, I am I, but I guess the big picture is you know I, it's it does seem to me that continuing to look into this issue and you know have maybe having a test field or something to continue to try different things as they come online because in the long term, the grass fields 
will be the better solution for the health of the students, but that's a well-maintained grass field. And you know, the, the research that you guys are proving on the ground is, you know, it, it seems like this one needs continued work before it gets, you know, implemented district-wide or something. Um, anyway, I don't, I just wanted to say that because, um, you know, I, my kid's now playing travel soccer and I, all the other parents, they're like, well, turf field, turf field. I'm like, but no, the off gas is the off gas is, but, you know, hearing this discussion about, especially the recovery time, it, this is challenging. Um, anyway, I will stop now. I, that's my comment. It wasn't really a question. Thank you, Mr. Jakuda. Ms. Kwok. Yes, thank you so much. And I apologize, I'm gonna have to run too because it's our back to school night in a moment. Um, I definitely appreciate the complexity of all of the different um, issues that are having to be balanced in thinking about turf <laughs> and versus grass. Um, like Beth, you know, this sort of topic, it could be very easily a very boring one, but for me, it's just a fascinating one because you're talking about youth, you're talking about sports, you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about all these different issues. Um, and when you wind them all together, they make a very complex systemic challenge. And you wanna prioritize uh, youth sports, of course, you wanna prioritize the health of the children, but we also have to consider those environmental costs. Um, so I, I might have missed some of the, uh, during the presentation, I was in the middle of doing late bus pickups, um, <laughs> but um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about how the county is taking into consideration those environmental impacts. Um, I don't, I don't have too much knowledge in terms of whether there is different types of turf fields, ones that are more harmful to the environment and more harmful to youth than others, and whether there are considerations in terms of how to mitigate against some of those environmental impacts. And just thinking again about the excessive uh, use of plastics and toxic uh, materials that could affect groundwater, surface water, air quality, not to mention the exposure to those, uh, you know, um, those types of toxins and chemicals that could really have long-term impact on, on the health of the children who are closer to the those fields. You know, their, their bodies are closer to the ground and um, as a result, much more exposed to these, um, these toxins. Um, I wanted to just kind of ask that question. I also wanted to flag that there are some really interesting academic conversations going on around climate and sport and turf um, fields. And I think that perhaps that could benefit some of the conversations and especially thinking through the complexity of some of these issues. So uh, thanks for the opportunity and I apologize, I'll have to leave in a few minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Kwok. Any response? Um, I see you, Mrs. Smith. Yeah, I just wanna make sure I add. Okay, um, so yes, I, there is to answer a few of your questions. So yes, the uh, turf field industry has a host of additional uh, alternatives. Uh, what you consistently hear about is not so much about turf fields, you hear more so about the crumb rubber infill, uh, which is really the uh, recycled tire content. Uh, that is the one that uh, the public and community, um, you know, um, has vocalized some of the discontent around some of the health concerns and things of that nature. Uh, that is something that the EPA uh, was looking into, uh, and, and there's a uh, well-documented cases of, of them not, you know, identifying that the toxins uh, are a higher level than what you would see in our, our typical natural grass with all the chemicals uh, and fertilizer and the things of that nature that you will put into, uh, you, know, you know, maintaining a natural grass field. Uh, and so that, but that's a whole nother. But to answer your question, that is, there are alternatives, right? There are uh, sustainable uh, alternatives. One of the ones that you know, are, and some of the concerns with the alternatives are really just the historical data as it relates to plain surface and health impact. Some of the uh, alternatives they have like uh, wood chips or um, cork is another one. Um, you know, the, the, 
the historical data for playing safety isn't there. Uh, and also there's increased maintenance as it, as it relates to using cork because it, when it rains, the cork material then rises because it's buoyancy and then distributes across the field. And now you have low spots on the field. So that is not one that is uh, something that we would consider, but they do have EPDM, uh, which is uh, more so like uh, recycled tennis shoes. And so you don't have the impact of uh, and concerns from the tires. Now you're actually, um, you know, recycling tennis shoes. That is something that goes towards sustainability. Uh, you know, at that point, it's it's not even a black rubber. You can get it in multicolor. You can get it in green. And so now you have a reduction in some of the uh, heat effect that you know people uh, you know have had concerns about as it relates to just the heat of turf fields as well. And so you know all that to say, yes, there all there there are alternatives uh, that exist. Um, of course, alternatives come at uh, additional costs related to delivery to projects, uh, but that is uh, an option that, that is available, or those are options that are available um, for us to be able to use. Thank you for that, Mr. Smith. Um, okay, I see Mr. Meyer, and then I'll go after you. The floor is yours, Mr. Meyer. Thank you very much, Chair Harris. Um, I am fairly new to this discussion. I will start off by saying that I... Uh, my oldest child is just entering sixth grade this year, and so this is our first year being at a school that actually has an athletics field. Um, and I will admit also that as I was hearing some of the discussion back and forth earlier, one of the first thoughts that came to my head was a reminder that this is ultimately the climate action work group, not necessarily the athletic advancement work group. And so I do want to make sure that the conversation stays focused on that climate change action mission. Um, but hearing Director Stefanelli talk about some of the challenges with field recovery and other issues, if we are going to pursue a dual track where we're trying to uh, look at both natural grass fields and seeing what we can do to make them more efficient, um, some of the pilot projects like you mentioned, uh, while also having turf fields in existence, are there other steps that we can take to have a positive climate impact um, I believe it was uh, Mr. Smith who mentioned that some of these projects have evolved, that it's no longer just the fields, it's more stadium operators, overall stadium renovations. And you, you mentioned LED, LED signs, you mentioned stadium lighting. Is there ways that we can make, if we're going to have a field that might be considered to be a little bit more environmentally unfriendly, at least have environmental upgrades in all other aspects of these stadium renovations? Yes, so absolutely. You know, all of our uh, our approach to our comprehensive stadium renovation projects is really just, you know, while we're improving, you know, all of the athletic components of a stadium, but it's also with, you know, um, you know, making sure that we are being environmentally friendly with, you know, some of the uh, introduction of some of the um, aspects, you know, so whether or not that is the LED lighting, like you mentioned, and the LED monitor that you mentioned, all of our egress lighting, that's also LED. You know, those are also components that we're actually actively looking at trying to uh, see if we can actually get rebates for as well to save the district money and be able to get some money back. So there are uh, areas um, and to, to be able to, you know, to your point that we can say, well, this, you know, while we we have uh, something that may be perceived as not environmentally friendly, we are moving forward with some of the aspects that are uh, more energy efficient uh, and, and aligned with sustainability. But I will say just, you know, as we as we're talking about just, you know, the um, category, you know, seven and the commitment to resilient land management, the focus of that, you know, that section was more so around stormwater runoff, right? And 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 what does it impact if you have heavy runs, uh, heavy rains and, and flooding and and what impact does it have to neighborhoods, communities, things of that nature? Turf fields uh, in, in terms of between turf fields and natural grass, turf fields are the most uh, um, impervious area that you can get as it relates to increasing or re reducing the amount of stored or runoff into a community uh, versus a natural grass. It's hard compact. It's rolled. It doesn't, you know, filtrate and absorb within that space. So then you have flooding that actually permeates outside of that athletic, you know, area. You know, within a turf field, you have large drains and, and filters and things of that nature and, and uh, gravel to help you know, drain out all of the uh, contaminants and then runs into our, our stormwater uh, ponds underneath the field and then uh, transition into our, our drains as well and to, to go to um, your stormwater utility. So, um, but in terms of just what the, the initial concept was, our concern was more so about stormwater runoff, not so much about um, 
turf field impact. And I'm, and so, you know, but that is, I, I read that and I was questioned, you know, well, how did we get to the point where we we're talking about transitioning turf fields to grass fields if it was solely focused on, uh, or at least one of the priorities was focused on store water runoff, which turf fields uh, hands down would be a, um, um, a better solution uh, for storm water management practices. Yes, and then to follow up with Mr. Smith, you know, originally they just we just put turf fields in, just like we would a grass field. Now where it's a comprehensive plan, and within that plan, we can put in bioretention ponds, we can put in filtering systems that that reduce the amount of the infill that ends up in our water system. And that was one of our biggest issues when we developed this plan was the runoff from the fields. So there is a way to put that into our program to stop that part of it. The recycling of the field at the end of its use is it also an issue, but I think the, the main issue was the constant runoff from the, um, from the, the infill into the, into the local waterways. And we, and they now have ways to stop that from happening. So we are, more environmental friendly now than we were 10 years ago when we started this process. Thank you both very much for those answers and I appreciate both of them very much. Thank you, Mr. Mar. Uh, so colleague, I'm gonna go first cause then I gotta jump for back to school and I'll turn it over to you if that's okay. Sounds good. Um, so just to piggyback a bit around the conversation um, on turf fields before I get to my question, and I enjoy kind of looking into the science of these things, right? Like turf field versus natural fields. And you see a lot of um, what I'll call scary science when it comes to turf fields. You'll hear things like um, volatile organic compounds or VCOs that can be emitted from um, from this surface if it gets too hot. You'll hear things like uh, forever chemicals or um, PFAS, whatever it's called, uh, that that is a class of kind of man-made chemical that that can be found in the groundwater or soil as well as anything that could emit off of that turf like methane and gases and things like that not only those components from the the, the scientific side but also just safety concerns when it comes to actually playing on those fields um with things like um uh, uh dust and, and microplastics and things like that breaking off of the field and so i think it's important again to have those studies so that we understand exactly what a turf field offers to almost uh, mitigate some of the challenges that we're seeing on the natural grass side while still dealing and working with um, solutions that help to combat some of those negative things that I'm saying that can actually happen with those fields. Um, so let me get to my question with my last minute here. Um, Mr. Smith, during your during your uh, presentation, you mentioned the, the path or the map that we had for upcoming um, dollars, dollars to spend. One of the buckets you identified was the 9.2 unspent unspent that was going into Douglas and Crossland for stadium renovations in 2025. Beyond that, um, do we have, uh, I guess, a projection of what's next for us after 2025? What's next on the list? What's next to do? And have we already identified potential grant dollars or monies that can be spent toward those? Yes, let me pull. So uh, in terms of our priority order, if that's what the question is more so about the priority order. So after uh, with the 9.2, the bulk of that is being uh, prioritized for Frederick, Doug Frederick Douglass to be able to move that one forward with a uh, balance of our funding request to, to come online to push Crossland. Uh, we actually just completed the uh, the new uh, press box and, and grandstand project at Crossland as well. And so we're actually making some headway um, while we were still waiting for the comprehensive funding to support, uh, you know, renovating everything there. Um, then we have Duval High School, of course, that we, we talked about, uh, followed by uh, Central High School, Friendly High School, Parkdale, Largo, uh, and I believe Surrattsville is, uh, is after Largo. And so that is kind of the, the priority order for the next six, five or six years, um, based on which is all contingent on, on funding, of course. Okay. Thank you. All right, colleague Booza Strauss. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back a little bit in time to um, a little more than two years ago when we had this initial discussion. And as with, at the time when I was co-chairing this with Joseph Takuda, the original 
uh, plan work group, I actually brought this topic forward and it came from my personal experience uh, with my son on the Northwestern High School artificial turf field uh, that was being rented by the NFL flag football program, which is for about pre-K, K through I think 14 year olds. And he was pretty young at the time, I think seven or eight. And um, the heat index on that field um, was um, literally breathtaking. <laughs> we could not breathe. We did not have anywhere to go for breath <laughs> like on that field as parents on the sideline and our children, many who have asthma in our school system, including my son, were in that heat. And it was a moment of, of me going from zero thinking about fields to shock of the experience and, you know, the rubber that filled up our shoes and just, you know, that experience and, and thinking about um, as we got into this work around the realities of heat and indexes and um, health. Uh, on the field and and worry for our future. So I did just want to go back in time a little bit. And then we did have some advocates who work on this address us during that process. And I'll make sure we follow up on which date that was. I was having trouble quickly finding it. But at the time, Mr. Stefanelli um, gave us a really great history on, you know, be, prior to artificial turf being invented, you know, master gardeners took care of these lands and, um, you know, we, we, you know, sports went, you know, went on. And um, so that we, we, what's old could be new again. And I, I'm happy that we're looking at these alternatives as well and trying what's new in the marketplace. But I really think uh, the politics in the marketplace are going to move towards the removal of the current product I mean, maybe a sustainable product will actually be created that everyone loves, um, just like electric buses and others that and 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 construction products and materials we could have never thought of, um, like carbon reducing cement, you know, things like that. So, I'm hoping that that we all just, you know, that the the marketplace because the the laws are going to start making it untenable to to put in more artificial turf. So that's kind of where I sit as someone who has been in this um, as a discussion for PGCPS for the last like two and a half, three years. So thank you. Mr. Smith. So just to, to, to provide context to uh, the first comment you made about just the heat index. So yes, that is that is one of the downsides uh, of not turf fields, but using crumb rubber, right? And so when we're thinking about uh, turf fields from an affordability standpoint, uh, trying to maximize the dollar so we can do more, crumb rubber is the most cost efficient um, infill that you can provide. It comes at the the con, of course, of, you know, black attracts heat. Now you're absorbing that heat into the field, you know, and now it's displacing the heat and now you see the heat effect uh, and ultimately the increase in heat on the field. I've, I've seen actually molded cleats uh, melt uh, as, a as it relates to it, depending on a really hot day. Um, but with the alternative infills, it's, it's not even just the alternative infills, you also have some additional components that that you could uh, implement in the turf uh, to actually reduce the heat effect. And so using uh, one of the, um, the alternates, alternate infills, uh, EPDM, uh, you go away from that heat effect, uh, where it's a reduction, of, I think it's 20, 25% of temperature on the field versus if you use the crumb rubber. So uh, I just want to provide that context. So there are solutions currently uh, and new technologies currently to, to assist with that. Um, and so that's something that could be implemented uh, in future projects. Yeah, thank you so so much. And I I think I've been I've been handed the chair seat <laughs> in this moment. I think uh, Dr. Harris. Oh no, Dr. Harris, you're still here. Do you want to keep going or do you need to depart? Well, if there's no more discussion here, we're on our last item, so I can. Okay. Close. So right. if there's no further discussion, committee. I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you, team, for your presentation, Mr. Smith, Mr. Stefanelli, uh, Mr. Malock, and Dr. Coleman. Uh, and thank you for being here tonight. We're gonna jump down to item 3.1, which is next steps. The next Climate Change Action Plan Ad Hoc Committee will be held on October 16th, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. This meeting will be virtual. 
please check the PGCPS board webpage for more information. Uh, again, thank you everyone for a great meeting and meaningful discussion around priority number seven, dealing with our turf fields and natural grass. As you know, it is a very complex issue that we'll continue to delve into. And thank you to the administration and their team for the work that they're doing here. There being no fur future further business to come before the committee this evening, the time is 5.42 p.m. and the September 11, 2024 Climate Change Action Plan Ad Hoc Committee meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Have a Thank good one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take care, everyone.